Hello, I'm Tara Brabazon and I'm the Dean of Graduate Research at Flinders University. Welcome to Vlog 270. Mediocrity. Meaning and management. Okay, so well, we've got a story to tell to start us into the vlog this week. Uh, a student I saw about a month ago now, very upset, and she was frightened, and she was confused, and she described herself as paralysed. And I asked her, why? why? Why are you feeling like this? And she said, I've made the realisation that I'm just mediocre. So I thought in this Rescue Ourselves <laughs> series that we would help this remarkable student and also help ourselves. And it's a great time to be having this conversation because remarkable literature has emerged in the last two to three years exploring this very term. So I found a lot of this material quite confronting. I don't know if I agree with all of it, but let's present the arguments and see if we can move ourselves forward today. And this was a really challenging vlog for me to research and to write, because as you know, I've often argued that the greatest problem that PhD students face is perfectionism. And I've often described for students, actually the PhD is the worst research project you'll ever do. It's the worst research project you'll ever do, not the best, because it's the first one you do. But by the same token, it's the worst project you'll ever do, but it is the best that you can do now. That's the difference. So you can see I've had a lot of fun this week. So let's get into this. What actually is mediocrity? And what's its role in our research cultures and particularly the PhD research culture? So can we just all as a family now, let's just take a breath. And you're probably where I started a couple of months ago, but let's take a breath and think about how you define the word mediocre. What's mediocre? Most of us sort of go, you know, a bit average, right? A bit middling, sort of, you know, in between, sort of not great, not dreadful, you know, just in between, right? Now, Presh Onyi in 2018 really challenged the definition that a lot of us have come into this vlog with, I think. And hang on to yourself. So Onyi described mediocrity as, quote, any point in time where you cannot attest that a thing or person is either great, poor, or average. End of quote. Firstly, I love the use of the word attest. I'm going to be using that through the rest of the day. But what we're arguing here is that Mike, if he's not poor, if he's not great, if he's not average, then he's mediocre. So what's going on here? Well, for on ye, mediocrity is defined as someone that is not consistent. Isn't that interesting, right? So he uses the metaphor of a mountain, right? So if we climb to the top of the mountain, we're up. When we go to the bottom of the mountain, we're down. When we're halfway up on the mountain and having a rest or having a sleep, then we're average. Okay, so as you can see, average by this definition is not mediocre because, this is interesting, we've made a decision to be average and we're accountable for that decision. Hmm. So the argument is that mediocrity emerges through a lack of consistency. So that is when we're sitting on the fence and not quite sure what we're going to do or what we want to do. So this is really important in a doctoral program if we follow through on this definition. The mediocre cannot be great. They cannot be poor. But the mediocre can change, can make a decision to change. But at the moment, they're mediocre because they're inconsistent. That is, they're not consistent with their performance. They're not consistent with their learning. They're not consistent with their research. So think about all the other synonyms that we use for mediocre. I often thought like ordinary, right, or common, middle of the road, or fair. You know, it's fair. You're fair. That's all right. That's mediocre. But you'll see that one attribute of all these words 
is lacking consistency. Okay, and Onyi offers a kicker on the way out of the remarkable article where he states, quote, no one remembers the mediocre. End of quote. Oh yeah. So this means in your degree, in your employment, in your teaching, in your research, if you produce a consistency of a result, people around you can make a decision about you. So they may think you're great, they may think you're dreadful, but at least if you're consistent, they can make a determination. Interesting. The mediocre, therefore, rarely receive a response from people because we can't quite determine what this person is or how their behavior is understood. Now, wow, okay, wow. Now, you may not be convinced by that analysis. I'm not sure I am either, but wow, it is a good series of ideas to focus on. And we'll return to this in a second about consistency. So let's just remember that. And of course, that argument does fit incredibly strongly with an article that's just been released this year from Gherkin and Karaman. And they did a remarkable piece of research on COVID-19 and placed COVID-19 in the history of disaster capitalism. Wow, truly great article. And they explored, quote, the cultures of fear and the impact of the capacity of individuals, organizations, nations, nations to make a decision. So they argue that the culture of fear is blocking our organizations and us as people from actually making a decision. Wow. So I wanted to add one more stream of definitions into our conversation today before we get cracking. And I particularly want to talk about this book because I think it's the best book I've read probably in five years. So this is Ajima Aluo's Mediocrity. <laughs> and the book was published in 2020. She argues that mediocrity is not invested or demonstrated by individuals. She argues that mediocrity is demonstrated by what she describes as, quote, oppressive systems, end of quote. In other words, let, let's go hard on this. What's the point of doing a PhD? Do our international universities want you to succeed? Hard questions, eh? So what is the use of a PhD student to an institution? There are many answers to that question. So, for example, PhD students are cheap research assistants that write and enable the bulk of publications in specific disciplines. PhD students might pay fees. They might actually have a completion payment for the university. So that's the reason why PhD students exist in a university. Now, these are very harsh economic realities in the doctoral space. But you'll notice that none of these uses of a PhD student involve you being excellent. They simply involve you being consistent turning up and doing some work. So, do our universities want you to succeed? Tough question. And it has to be a tough question because these are now very, very tough workplaces. A senior manager made of mine last week told me a, a terrible story, so on the day uh, a senior researcher said, let's have, an, uh, let's have a meeting. Let's have a meeting at 4 p.m. today. Let's have a meeting 4 p.m. today. And one of the gentlemen that was invited to this meeting said, look, sorry, I can't get there at 4. I'm picking up my kids. And the senior researcher replied, couldn't you get your wife to do it? So... Our universities clearly are often an inhumane workplace where work is required and the cost of that work on individuals and families is ignored, is irrelevant. So as you can see, mediocrity on an organisational level is not bland, it's not harmless. Ulu 
described it as, quote, a cultural complacency with systems that are horrifically oppressive, end of quote, and, quote, a dedication to ignorance. Ooh, okay. So she argues that mediocrity creates false equivalences between aggression and leadership, arrogance and strength. <laughs> wow. Okay. So she provides a context and a history around that odd phrase, you know, why can't you get your wife to do it, by showing the resentment towards women in the workplace since the Second World War. So what interests me, though, and that's a big debate, by the way, but what interests me is particularly the impact of all of this on our doctoral students. And I want to therefore bring all these definitions together and look at the relationship between meritocracy and mediocrity, right? Meritocracy and mediocrity. Let's do this. So meritocracy is the assumption that if you just work hard enough, you'll be successful. If you just work hard enough, you'll be successful. Now, of course, this is nonsense. Obviously, some of the hardest working people on this planet never get on, right? But the consequences of that ideology is inverted when we're thinking about mediocrity. You see, if someone is in a position of power, there is the assumption that they've worked hard to get there. And, of course, the nature of our universities the sociology of these organisations shows the exact opposite. Particular groups are assumed to be successful and they have an easier pathway through life and through progression in our universities. Full stop. So this means that the mediocre are in positions of power. And once they are in power, the ideology of meritocracy sustains their influence. And it also sustains the lie that hard work creates success. So this means that in universities we have a very limited definition <laughs> of greatness. And that creates very odd definitions of mediocrity. So the barriers that we're talking about in universities and outside of them have existed, of course, for centuries. And we need to remember that the bulk of the world's population has never really had a chance to get out of poverty, absolute or relative, remains in positions of powerlessness, and very rarely the bulk of the population have a chance of gaining higher education. Okay, so these barriers are reinforced by a blaming culture where those with less power are blamed for their shortcomings because they just haven't worked hard enough. <laughs> so as you can see, universities can be different. Universities can be a defiant place. They can be. We have a chance. We have a choice in our universities and our doctoral programs. We can create a vista for the world where the mediocre but powerful have to justify their position. And that, by the way, is why the political forces around the world who wish to reinforce the status quo are so anti our universities. And, you know, they use phrases like, what are the current phrases like, cancel culture? trigger culture, political correctness. So all these phrases, supposedly talking about freedom of speech, all these phrases are used to silence people who have worked hard, gained a degree, pretty clever, and who are trying to create an alternative way of thinking about the world, where the brilliant and the hardworking are rewarded rather than the mediocre and the powerful being rewarded. So, <laughs> interesting, hey! Um, and so therefore, let's finish off this vlog quickly with 10 quick tips taking all these different definitions and interpretations of mediocrity and seeing what we could all do today to move ourselves out of this word. Okay, let's do it. Okay, number one is the obvious one, and that is focus. 
If you want to move beyond these multiple definitions of mediocrity, there are two clear strategies, focus and consistency. The singular strategy to avoid mediocrity is focus. The singular strategy to encourage mediocrity is overcommitment. If you show up, if you focus on a task, then you won't be mediocre. If you are unreliable, if you demonstrate the consistency of a Teletubby that's run out of tubby custard, then it's not going to go well. Focus. Two, mediocrity emerges through a fear of failure rather than a fear of success. Now, I would argue COVID-19 has intensified this problem. Some remarkable projects that I'm reading at the moment, and wow, isn't there some great research happening in this area, but a lot of the research I'm reading at the moment, qualquant and theoretical studies, are showing the long-term consequences of this fear and this trauma, yeah? Now, I've certainly noticed, I've always been actually very notice, noticeable in Australia, since I returned to Australia, about the fear of failure in this nation. It's a real thing. It's a fear, fear of failure. Sometimes called the tall poppy syndrome, yeah? But basically, it's a fear of failure. And so much of our culture is, is based around, you know, avoiding being ridiculed, avoiding being labelled, avoiding some random shout and at you, right? The whole culture is really geared for that. And I get it, because it's horrible when that happens. But the problem we've got is this fear of failure means that we're always incredibly careful, incredibly cautious, and so cautious that we never actually really do anything. <laughs> and we're so frightened that our work has to be checked all the time by supervisors or advisors or bosses. And this problem is, of course, made worse by helicopter management or micromanagement. So I really get this. This is a fear of failure. But that leads us <clears throat> straight into the vortex of mediocrity because we never really strive, we never really try because we might fail. So understand what the problem is, understand how it exists in yourself and what you can do about it. And as I've always said, the best thing we can do is recognize it in ourselves. So call it, label it, determine. It is a fear of failure. And once you have put a language around that, then you're able to manage it. Three, continual learning and professional development. Now, this is my biggest strategy to avoid mediocrity in pretty well the entirety of my life. And basically, to be honest, it's my strategy to manage just about any <laughs> challenge or weakness I may confront. I have led and I'm very proud to say this, I have led a reading life. I have led a learning life. And that's great because it means on a daily basis, I'm exposed to a diversity of ideas. And it's great because we improve so many other skills through learning and professional development, whether it is reading or writing or listening or interpretation skills, crucial. You know, we think more precisely about epistemology and ontology and methodology. Precision. Brilliant. So professional development, why I do it, is it allows me to get out of myself, right? Outside my normal, outside my expectations, my history, my parameters. Get out of it. See something different. Different lens. Come on. So we gain the views and the perspectives of others. And therefore, the best way to scupper mediocrity is to learn something new every day. Four, recognize failure and label it as feedback. Ooh. So we've already talked about this fear of failure. And that is the fear and that is the failure that keep on giving. Now, the best way, if you can, to manage failure, and this is tough, I know this, is to implement a strategy that we introduced last week in our vlog on words. And one of those strategies was the replacement strategy. So this is a word that you use that hurts you and just force yourself to, with consciousness, put another word in its place. OK, so this is quite important if we start to apply this replacement strategy to failures. Right. What if 
we consider a failure simply feedback. So take the word failure out, call it feedback. Now to do that, we have to take the emotion out. Because when we fail, did you, did you feel your whole body, you're a failure, fail. Your whole body sort of goes, oh, I am, right? So you've got to get the emotion out. So, okay, failure, get yourself calm with the word. Desensitize the word, failure is feedback. So if you think about it, when a failure emerges in our professional or personal lives, that is a moment of feedback. This will change our lives if we can do this. So what happens is we take the emotion out of the situation and we learn from the feedback. Come on. So this means we are creating endless professional development moments, a learning moment. And these learning moments will align us and move us out of mediocrity. Now, I know failure is tough. I know that. I fail a lot. Failure is tough. But feedback is important. And mediocrity emerges when we treat feedback as failure. Excellence emerges when we treat failure as feedback. Come on. Come on. Six. Ask the right questions of yourself and others. We can't reach the right answers if we're not asking the right questions. So I just wanted to, in the context of the vlog this week, put a couple of questions out there for you to consider, to think they might do an intervention in how you're doing and enacting your work day. Because good questions can propel you through change and into achievement. So I'll just put two questions into this vlog to maybe move you out of mediocrity. Question one, what will make you proud at the conclusion of this PhD? What will make you proud? Now this is a long term question, a big question, an important question. But question two is, how can I improve this week on the research that I did last week? How can I improve this week on the research I did last week? That's a short term agenda. Now, I ask both these questions of myself on a weekly basis. So what would make me proud at the conclusion of this research project? I just sent my 20th book off to a publisher last week. And I ask myself, what would make me proud about this research project? Great question. But I also ask every Sunday night, what am I going to do in my research this week that will improve it on what I did last week? They might help you. Seven, celebrate the wins. Now, as you know, we're all moving through this Rescue Ourselves <laughs> series together, really. And I'm applying what I'm talking about and what I'm reading in the research to my own life as well. I'm going through a lot of complicated big life decisions at the moment. You yeah, know, that's what we're all doing and I'm doing it as well, moving through some complicated life choices and decisions. And so this research and the conversations I'm having, and I should say thank you to the thousands of messages and emails I've received on this. I'm so grateful and I thank you all very much. But can I say this celebrating success bit of this story today is something I've done incredibly badly in my life. So I've got a lot to learn here because I, I really haven't celebrated the wins ever, actually. Something wonderful's happened and I've maybe sort of smiled and gone, that's great. And then I've moved on to the next thing. And I've done that through my entire life. Okay. And look, a lot of life is completely pointless, boring, and dreadful. I get that. That's absolutely true. And therefore, when something remarkable happens, how about you stop? Speak the words. This is, this is a great moment for me. Share that great moment. Experience that joy if you can. And, and sit. Sit in the celebration for a moment. Because success is certainly the punctuation of our lives. But further, success is a pointer. And, and it points you out of mediocrity. So name your achievements, claim your achievements, stop, pause and celebrate them. 
And can I say, and this is again something I'm thinking about in my life at the moment, listen to what your successes are telling you about your research, about your colleagues, and about yourself. Eight, persistence matters. Now, in the research I've done on mediocrity, and it's just been brilliant, okay? I disagree with a lot of it, but wow, I've enjoyed it, okay? So the research I've done on mediocrity, look, I was stunned whether, whether I went through the Qualquant or I went through the theoretical interpretive studies, that all the studies showed the power of persistence, right? So just hanging in there, showing up, <laughs> is a way to get out of mediocrity. And that means just, you know, front, get there, be active, and just work, front, come on, just do it. Persistence, therefore, will create achievement. Persistence will get you out of mediocrity. And on a personal note, can I say this one did really speak to me, you know, a lot of pretty dreadful stuff happens in all our lives. A lot of pretty dreadful stuff has happened in my life, no doubt about it. And can I just say, all the success, if I've gained any, but all the success I've gained in my life, none of it, none of it, has come from mentoring or patronage or networking. None of it. None of it. But showing up, continuing to show up, even when times are tough, that'll get you somewhere. That'll get you somewhere. Nine, don't confuse the acceptable with the excellent. I am putting this on a t-shirt. Uh, as we talked about at the start of the vlog, the university system really doesn't want you, or me, or any of us, doesn't want you to be excellent. The system wants the people in power to remain in power because universities are also gatekeepers. They can figure insiders and outsiders. And look, if you come from a working class background, you are a citizen of colour, you are an indigenous citizen, you're a non-binary trans colleague, you're a woman perhaps, then look, to be frank with you, our universities historically have just not been constructed to enable your success, right? This system wants you to fit in, produce acceptable teaching, be a good teacher, not receive complaints, and uh, do some research and finish your doctorate. Now, excellence requires that you move beyond the acceptable and transcend the mediocre. Now, you're going to receive a lot of feedback, which you may read as failure, <laughs> but you know what? Persist. Show up. I've always said the greatest revenge for people that hate you is just keep showing up. Hi, how's it going? <laughs> and look, you may not be acceptable to the system, but if you show up, you might just change it. Ten. <laughs> Remain optimistic. Now, you know, I'm an old goth, right? I know this is not going to end well. I know none of us are going to get out of here alive. Okay, I know that. But research from Baseo Anjouan, great book, 2020 book again, Transcending Mediocrity. And this remarkable writer shows the value, the benefit of optimism. Anjouan particularly reveals the impact and the consequences of being cynical or negative about other people's success. So optimism requires a respect of others and also learning le lessons from others. So this is not about competition. This is not about credibility. It's about moving outside of self-absorption, moving outside of narcissism and valuing and respecting people, whoever they are, and respecting and valuing those people, knowing that we can learn from everybody. We can learn from everybody. So there's so much envy and jealousy and ripping people off in universities. We all know it. And these states emerge, I think, because we don't respect the life 
and the values and the expertise, the learning of others. COVID, I think, has tested all of us. There's all this stuff at the moment about, you know, oh, we're going post-COVID to a new normal. You know what the stuff about a new normal? Yeah. Now, that may be the case, but I do think we need to recognise and we need to name what that old normal was precisely. And that old normal was a culture of debt, Veblen-inspired conspicuous consumption, fitting in, settling for less. That was the old normal. Now, much of life and much of our universities, they're set up so that you will fit in and you will do as you are told. It's extraordinary, isn't it? But is it? The extraordinary is actually rare. That's why it's extraordinary. But the binary opposition that we're going to finish with is not mediocrity versus the extraordinary. The relationship between the mediocre and the extraordinary is configured by one simple question. What are you prepared to accept? What are you prepared to accept? Look at the ruins. Look at the state of our lives before and during COVID. Have a good look. Have a good think. Have those past normalities served you? Served your life? Served who you want to be? Now, what I've learnt from this week on mediocrity, and as you can see, I'm deeply moved by a lot of this. What I've learnt from this week on mediocrity is that we must not lose sight of our big goals. We must not. We must not allow some hashtag random in our lives to use that dreadful phrase. You just need to be realistic. Be realistic. Can't tell you how often in my life some random goes, sorry, you're just not realistic. You've got to be realistic. The realistic gives us conformity and mediocrity. You are settling for the place that the system has written for you. Big goals, big goals, persistence are two attributes that will move you out of mediocrity. So let's therefore finish with you. Hi. Are you willing to commit for the long term? Are you willing to invest your most precious resource? Your time. Your life. You can only spend time on the things that matter if you actually know and you've named what matters. Life doesn't give you a report card. You can't fail at life. And actually failure is not a reflection on the self. Failure is a feedback on your experience so you can do better next time. I wish you love, light and peace. Tea out.